Well, good morning, everyone. We had a good week. Everyone, anyone finished their Christmas shopping? Oh, no, there's a couple of hands. That's worrying. I haven't started. So I spent the week in Glasgow. I've been up in, a, in Scotland on a, a training event. And uh, my week began at half past five on Monday morning uh, as I was catching a train out of Birmingham Station all the way up there um, at quarter past seven. And uh, I looked at Google, and Google was telling me that it wasn't going to take me as long as I'd anticipated to get to Birmingham because, of course, no one was on the roads at half past five, so I hit the snooze button. And uh, then the alarm went off again. I'd been planning to you know, leave at quarter, quarter to six, but I thought, actually, I could probably leave at six. So I had an extra bit of snooze, an extra bit of snooze, and uh, got onto the road at six, and then was sort of big, my anxiety levels began to rise a little bit as uh, I hit some roadworks as I was coming into Birmingham that maybe Google hadn't picked up. And then I planned to put my car, I, I, I booked a parking space in a car park next to the station and uh, it was locked and I couldn't get my car into the car park and my, my watch was ticking away and quarter past seven was getting nearer and nearer and uh, I pressed on the buzzer and a man eventually came and let me into my car park. And then I had to kind of sprint to Birmingham New Street. And if, for those of you that have been there, you know that it's like there's a massive concourse. It's like a country. <laughs> so trying to find the platform <laughs> for my train, you know, was a bit stressful. And I eventually found it and charged down the escalators. And I literally landed on the platform as the train arrived into the station. And uh, I didn't miss it. But one of the reasons that I ended up sort of cutting it so fine, and my family will tell me about this, and my husband raises his eyebrows, is that I hate waiting. I hate waiting, so I don't like leaving margins. You know, what's the point of standing on a platform waiting for a train if you could be doing something else, like, you know, finishing a few chores at home or, you know, having a bit of extra sleep or whatever? And uh, one of my sons is made in my image. He hates waiting and he's a nightmare to travel with. And my daughter really likes waiting and being on time. So they actually now refuse to travel together anywhere because it is so stressful for, for, super, uh, for, for both of them. Actually, my family have a bit of a joke because I, when I look at supermarket queues, I'm always trying to work out the one that's going to go fastest. But I always pick the wrong one. So they say to me, which one are you going to pick? And then we'll go in a different one. <laughs> And I don't know about you, I don't know what you think about waiting. We've managed to reduce the amount of waiting, haven't we, that we have to do in life by a significant amount. Do you ever wonder what it would be like if your great-grandparents came back and kind of had to live <laughs> the way we live in this day and age? We don't have to wait to the for the shops to open anymore, do we? Because we can just hop online. And we don't have to wait very long for things to be delivered because Amazon is just, you know, normally pretty good at that. And we don't have to... Uh, wait a whole week to catch up with most of our favourite TV sh shows because we can just binge watch and flick on to the next episode after the current episode has ended. But I know that you know, because you have to do this too, that waiting is part of life, isn't it? Waiting is part of life. And uh, some things that we have to wait for are more challenging than others. If you're six, it's pretty challenging, isn't it, to wait on Christmas morning to have to open your presents. Maybe that's true of you now you know, at 36 or 56, I don't know. But waiting to hear news or to get test results or to find the right person or to uh, be able to buy a house. I've got some friends at the moment that are really struggling. They're waiting in rental accommodations, struggling to buy a house. Waiting for a baby, waiting for a better job or a promotion, waiting for a breakthrough in financial, your financial scenario, waiting for God's intervention, in a relationship, waiting for God to speak or guide, waiting for a loved one to become a follower of Jesus, waiting for God to move in your workplace, waiting for whatever, waiting for a cure for COVID. Waiting is part of life, isn't it? And for those of you that know about the liturgical calendar, we're in a season of waiting. But Advent is about expectant waiting, not just waiting, twiddling our thumbs on a platform for the train to come in, but expectant waiting. And we believe in a God of power, don't we? We believe in a God who does miracles. We pray for breakthroughs. We pray for God to do things in our world and in us and in our relationships and in our surroundings and in our circumstances that we can't do because we believe in a God who intervenes. But he is also a God who makes us wait. I hope you know that. He's a God who makes us wait. So for a thousand years, or for thousands of years, God's people were waiting for the moment that we celebrate at Christmas, weren't they? For Jesus to come 
to earth, for God to come to earth and to save his people. And as Tim was talking about last week, uh, we are now waiting for Jesus to come back, for Jesus to come back and sort out the world and sort out, you know, to put everything right, which we know he's going to do. But there is also other kinds of short-term waiting, isn't there? Abraham was given that promise that he was going to have a baby and he was going to be the father of, of, of generations, and yet he had to wait years, years and years for that promise to be fulfilled. David, he was anointed king, but he had to wait years to be released into uh, that reality. Joseph had to wait years for his dream to become fulfilled. Paul, actually, even though the New Testament is kind of one thing after another, you know, a bit of a sort of highlight reel, Paul had to wait years bef- between his calling, his, his encounter with Jesus, and his release into ministry. The bleeding woman, she waited 12 years for her healing. Even the final command that Jesus gave to his uh, disciples after he'd, be, he'd been resurrected, he'd said they were going to go, but the first thing he said to them was, you need to wait in Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but I find waiting incredibly hard. I find waiting for a train a bit challenging, but waiting on God, waiting for God to move, I find very challenging. And I know many of us, you know, find waiting for God to intervene, waiting for God to speak, waiting for God to break through, waiting for God to direct, waiting for his miracles or whatever is a challenging thing. So this morning we are going to talk about the work of of waiting. Because actually waiting, as I said, is not a passive thing. If God wants his people to wait with expectation. We're called to wait with expectation, to be a people of expectation because we are people who have a load of God's promises in our hands. And actually we walk by faith and we receive what God has promised us through faith. So we are to be a people, God expects us, God has designed us to be a people who wait with expectation. But therefore, there is a work when we are waiting to make sure that that expectation is part of our waiting. So we're going to talk about that this morning. And you know me, I love a good Bible story. So uh, if you've got a Bible, it, the words are going to come up on the screen. But if, you, if you've got a Bible, we're going to turn to uh, the first chapter in, in the book of Luke. And we're going to read the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah, which will be uh, familiar to uh, many of you. Uh, it's a, it's a, a kind of familiar Christmas story, and we're going to look at some of the things that God would say to us about this, the, the work for us in waiting so that we are a people who wait with expectation. So Luke chapter 1, verses 5 uh, to 20. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, or Abijah, I don't know how you say that. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in God's sight, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, Uh, He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were standing and praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Now just imagine that moment. Wouldn't you just, would you like to be visited by a nine-foot angel? I mean, I think it would be pretty cool if, I mean, I believe there are angels in here, and some people have a gift, actually, of being able to see angels in the spirit, but I think it would be really cool. I mean, maybe I wouldn't think so in that moment. If a nine-foot angel suddenly appeared, you know, leaning on that, you know, speaker or whatever with some good news, because this angel has got some good news. So when Zechariah saw him, verse 12, he was startled and gripped with fear. I don't know, maybe he had that kind of headmaster syndrome. I don't know if you have that, you know, when somebody kind of wants a word with you or turns up and says, I need to have a chat with you. I don't know about you, but you kind of slightly assuming it's going to be bad news or being ticked off for something. Maybe that was Zechariah, I don't know. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. Really good news. And you ought to call him John. He'll be a joy and a delight to you. Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or any other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. That's pretty epic. And he will bring many back 
Uh, He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he'll go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is such a big moment in Zechariah's life. Maybe it was the biggest moment of his life. I mean, he must have felt so seen and treasured and known by the Lord in that moment, right? This is the kind of story that you can dine out from, dine out on for years, you know, stick it on YouTube, give a little recount of it, it's guaranteed to get kind of millions of views, isn't it? So there we are, you know, Zechariah, absolutely amazed, delighted by this news, thrilled to pieces, reaches for his guitar, you know, starts praising and hollering and whooping and jumping on the spot. Not quite. Zechariah asked the angel, verse 18, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I don't quite know why he had to say that, but I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you the good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you didn't believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. And as we know, at the end of the story, you know, God fulfills his promise. Elizabeth gets pregnant. She has a baby. Uh, She's overjoyed. John is born. Zechariah gets his voice back, you know, a few days after the baby's born and their child goes on to be one of the kind of greatest heroes of the New Testament. So here we have, it's a story, isn't it, about a couple who knew a whole amount about waiting. You know, the Bible tends to hide so many details and so much backstory, doesn't it, in small little verses. But the headline here is that Elizabeth and Zechariah have waited and waited and waited and waited and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed to have a baby. But it didn't happen. And those of us who've had that specific experience of waiting either to have a baby uh, or that we know somebody who has been waiting to have a baby, we know how incredibly painful, how incredibly difficult, how incredibly challenging that kind of journey is and how much disappointment and how much heart-wrenching pain is involved in it. And all of that is hidden in this little summary verse. But in telling their story, Luke is keen that we should know two things. Verse 13, look at verse 13, they prayed. No doubt for a very, very long time. And he wants us to know in verse 6 and 7 that they'd been obedient believers in God all their lives. So what can we pull out of this passage on waiting, about the work of waiting, about our responsibility as it is in the waiting while we're waiting for God to move so that we remain people who actually, whilst we're waiting for him to do the things that we're contending for in our own lives, we bring expectation, expectancy for him to move, for the kingdom to come in the lives of those that we're around, praying for, believing for, contending for, speaking into. What can we pull out of this story? I think the first thing, because of what Luke highlights is that he wants us to remember that waiting is part of walking with Jesus. Waiting is part of walking with Jesus. So their inability, God says they were obedient, that they were blameless. What's he wanting to highlight by drawing our attention to that truth? That their inability to have children wasn't a punishment from God. You know, I think it can be often easy to fall into the trap, to become vulnerable to the lies of the enemy when God isn't doing what we're praying for, what we're contending for, what we're believing for, whether it's in our own lives or in the lives of other people, that for some reason, reason God's, God's, God has shut up shop on us, that maybe he's abandoned us, maybe he's forgotten us, maybe he's kind of cross with us, maybe he's fun, punishing us or whatever. We're not told why God made them wait, but Luke is really keen that we we are told they were blameless, they were obedient, they'd served God, they'd loved God, that they'd made God their priority all their lives, and yet they'd had to wait. For some reason, God made them wait. Waiting was part of their walk with God. 
Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we're incapable of pressing the pause button on some of the things that we're wanting to see God do in our lives and causing delay to the things that he wants to release either in us or through us or around us. We know that from the Israelites, don't we, in the wilderness. God hadn't planned to leave them in the wilderness for 40 years. But their disobedience in different forms, you know, delayed. They didn't stop, but they delayed God's miraculous leading of them into the promised land. And so if we're not listening to him, or we're not doing what he's told us to do, or the last thing that he's told us to do, yes, we can end up hitting the pause button. But what this story points out is that frequently God will make us wait for reasons that we don't understand. And it has nothing to do with whether we've been disobedient or not, whether we've been, you know, whether we've loved him or not. We don't know what the reason is here, but waiting is part of the walking. Why is it important to remember this? Because otherwise we can become disillusioned, can't we? And draw these wrong conclusions about how God feels about us. And to get twisted in knots, if there's just one more thing I could do, then I could somehow, you know, twist God's arm. Or I could, I could make him do what I'm asking him to do. And we can get stuck in that kind of area. The Father has promised, you know, hear it again this morning, Hebrews 13, 5. The Father has promised never to abandon you. He's promised never to abandon you. Isaiah 49, 15. He's promised that he cannot, not just he will not, but he cannot forget you. I'm sure Elizabeth and Zechariah felt forgotten. I'm sure at times they felt abandoned. I'm sure, you know, they felt that God was probably deaf to their cries. But God wants us to remember that walking, uh, waiting is part of our walking with Jesus. Secondly, part of our working to keep our expectation of God moving, you know, in, in, in miraculous ways in our own lives, but also in the lives of the communities, the families, the relationships, the workplaces, the people that we're praying for. We need to trust that God is working in the waiting. And that trust is an active intention, that God is working in your waiting. It's not an aimless sort of you're just sitting on a platform and God's doing nothing. God is working. God is always working in the waiting if we're praying. I don't know about you, but I sometimes find myself fantasizing what it might be like in heaven. You know, whether there's a kind of control room and God has this kind of spreadsheet or whether God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit stand by a whiteboard and they kind of are up there with all these different details of prayers that are being prayed down here and plans that they've got to release on the earth and promises that they've made over here and, you know, how it's all going to come together and how it all gets worked out for his glory and for our good. I don't know if you ever think about that. But Gabriel makes it clear as he arrives in Zechariah's place of of work, of service, Gabriel makes it clear, God hasn't just randomly chosen you for this amazing assignment. Gabriel says, God's heard your prayer. Gabriel makes it really clear that this moment now, where God has decided to move in your life, is a response to the prayers that you two have been praying. You thought God had forgotten you. You thought God hadn't been listening. But God's moving because he's heard your prayers. And I love the fact that what God is doing here is kind of colliding, as it were, his assignment to send John the Baptist into the world before Jesus. He's taking his dream and he's connecting it with their dream for a child. God's taking his kingdom purposes and his desires and intersecting it with with Elizabeth and Zechariah's desires. They'd had a dream for a kid, and it had become a desperate prayer to a God that they believed would help. And eventually those desperate prayers, years, years, years later, became a landing strip for God's desires and God's dreams. And they ended up with way more than they had ever imagined, dared imagine. And I want to say to you this morning, your unfulfilled dreams... You know, I believe God wants to encourage us this morning. Your unfulfilled dreams, your longings that are driving you to your knees because you know that you need God to intervene, they, are, they have the potential to be a landing strip for God's kingdom desires and dreams and purposes to be worked out in your life. But it requires expectant waiting. God took their dreams and desires and made them a landing strip from his. But there was a timing issue. 
God works in our waiting. There was a timing issue. Clearly, for whatever reason, the world wasn't ready for John the Baptist when Elizabeth and Zechariah started praying. The world wasn't ready for John the Baptist and for Jesus, and God had to get the world ready. So he was getting things right, people in place, circumstances ready, whatever. And there was a preparation issue in their own hearts. They may have been ready to have their own baby, but were they ready to raise a prophet who was going to prepare the way of the Lord? God was needed to work in their hearts too. And when God has these greater things in mind, you know, God has greater things in mind for us, for all of us, than we have for ourselves. That's the nature of who he is. You know, we think small, he thinks big. We dream small, he dreams big. He has greater things in mind for us than we have for us. But so often, there's a work that he needs to do in us to prepare us for those dreams that he wants to birth within us and fulfill through us. And actually, the waiting, the discomfort the uncertainty, the agony of waiting. If we're willing to wrestle with God, it sends us into a place where actually we, we do wrestle with him. And, you know, what, when, when um, Jacob wrestled with God, you know, a whole nation was birthed, wasn't he, as a result of wrestling. Things happen in us when we wrestle with God. And wrestling is often part of active waiting when we're contending for God to move. And he works in us so that he can work through us. And often it's very difficult to put our fingers on what he's doing. But God often needs to prepare us for what he has prepared for us. But here's the thing. God never wastes our waiting. He never wastes our waiting. He didn't waste their waiting. I think they probably thought it was completely wasted. That was the kind of amazing, amazing delight of the angel turning up. But he never wastes our waiting if we continue to wrestle with him. Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for the good of those who love us. And here they are, they'd stopped praying, but he was so merciful. He looked at what they'd done. He looked at the prayer they prayed. He looked at the trust that had been there, you know, earlier on in their lives. And that was what he responded to. And Elizabeth and Zechariah became a landing strip for his dream, John the Baptist. Waiting is part of our walking with Jesus. God is always working in our waiting. But in order to maintain expectation when we're waiting for God to move or when we're praying you know, in expectation for others, we have, to be, we have to be willing to keep dealing with disappointment. That's the thing that, that Zechariah didn't do. We had uh, a number of years ago, we lived uh, in Clarence Square, and uh, one day I began to notice these tiny little things, staple-like sized things, you know, up on the sort of, up just below the ceiling. There weren't very many of them, and, uh, you know, we had very high ceilings, couldn't really get rid of them, thought, oh, there's some kind of fly or whatever. And uh, those things began to sort of increase over the months, yes. And uh, somebody came in once and said, oh, they're carpet moths. You know, I thought they would go away, so we didn't pay much attention to them. And eventually I got a man from the council to come and tell me what I might be able to do with them. He was actually pretty useless. But what he did was he got out a strip, walked through my hallway. It had pheromones on it, walked through my hallway to see how bad it was. And actually these moths just appeared from who knows where, you know, like a plague in my hall because they had multiplied and multiplied and multiplied because I thought they were absolutely harmless and done absolutely nothing, nothing with them. It would have been so much easier to deal with them when I first saw them. Friends, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You know, it's a verse that we know and that we quote, but we need to take it seriously. It doesn't mean that therefore there will be no hope deferred in this world. It means we need to pay attention to hope deferred in our lives or our hearts will get sick. And hope deferred often comes from waiting waiting for God to move, waiting for God to break in, waiting for God to do what we believe he has promised us he's going to do. And when we experience disappointment as followers of Jesus, which many of us do from the pain of waiting, of unanswered prayer or whatever, of unfulfilled dreams and promises, it has the potential to go toxic in our hearts and to suffocate our expectation if we don't deal with it. We need to keep dealing with disappointment. Why? Because if we don't deal with it, it will open us up to the poison of discouragement. 
And discouragement then begins to lead us into a place of questioning God's heart for us, questioning his purposes for us, losing sight of his power to intervene, losing sight of his desire to break into his world, losing sight of what we've been called to as kingdom people to destroy the works of the enemy as Jesus did. Verse 18. Look back at verse 18. What was Zechariah's response? He didn't jump up and down, thrilled to pieces, because finally they were going to get what they'd wanted. His response was, how can I be sure? He's got a nine-foot angel standing in front of him. This isn't a kind of little quiet time, and there's a little thought dropped into his head that God's saying, actually, I'm going to give you a baby. He's got a nine-foot angel standing in front of him going, I'm Gabriel, and I've come from heaven. And he's going... How can I be sure? That comes from a really deep place, doesn't it? Because look what he says next. I'm really, really old and so is my wife. That's the expression of an an internal narrative that has no doubt been going on for years. God's not going to do it because I'm really old. You know, that's the outworking of a logic, of of a rational mindset that has got stuck in discouragement and disappointment. How can I be sure? How can I be sure this is you, God? How can I be sure you'll keep your promise? How can I be sure that you'll do it for us? How can I be sure it will actually happen? How can I be sure? I think this is the real cry of his heart. How can I be sure that I won't be disappointed again? I think that's what he was really saying. Aren't those the questions of someone whose heart has become sick with disappointment? Maybe you're familiar with those words. How can I be sure you want to bless me, Lord? How can I be sure that you really are good? How can I be sure that this, bu- this promise in the Bible is true? How can I be sure that you will guide me? How can I sh- be sure that you will rescue me? How can I be sure that you do want the best for me, that you will protect me, that you will speak to me? How can I be sure that it's you speaking? How can I be sure that you want to heal? How can I be sure? Do you know, there's been times on my own journey God's brought me back to that verse in in Hebrews 4. Hills, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. And it's interesting because he's not saying, Hills, you can't hear my voice. He's saying, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. You know, there's something about hearing his voice and then needing to hold on to it and pull it into our lives as a promise to put, you know, our trust in and to become expectant about Jesus sometimes reminds me I can hear his voice, but I can also harden my heart to what he's trying to say to me and plant in me through his truth and through his promises because I'm afraid of being disappointed. Friends, we're called to be a people of God who pray big prayers because we have a big God who believe for big things for other people, for our communities, for our workplaces, for our nation. We're called to be a people who are expectant, but expectation is tested, isn't it, in waiting. That's how, that's how we find out what level of kind of expectation really, we really have when we're not seeing what we're contending for. But any disappointment that we allow to take root in our hearts can end up blinding us to the goodness of God, to his heart for us, to his purposes for us as we kind of lose sight of Jesus and what he's promised like my carpet moths. So if that's you, I want to encourage you. If you know that you've got disappointment lurking away in your heart, I don't think we talk about it very often as Christians. It's kind of like, well, if I acknowledge I've got disappointment, then I've got no faith. It's a load of nonsense. Jesus always invites us to be honest with him. If you're somebody who, you know, you've got disappointment, I want to encourage you to deal with it. Talk to someone. You know, let someone pray with you. Be really, really real and honest with God. He knows about it. He can see it. So just take it to him. And for Zechariah, there was a consequence of not dealing with this disappointment. You know, we might think a bit harsh. I read a commentary this week. You know, God, God said, you, you're gonna, the angel said, you're going to lose your voice. Ten months, you're going to lose your voice. Somebody, I read something this week where somebody said, lots of people think that was a punishment, but actually maybe it was God's kindness doing something else. As if God's discipline isn't his kindness. God's a God who disciplines, Hebrews 10, but he disciplines us because he loves us. They're not separate things. 
I think it was discipline, but I think it was God's kindness. Why? Because the power of life and death is in the tongue. And I think Zechariah was probably going to be speaking out all kinds of doubts and discouragements, potentially. You know, and God wanted to protect John the Baptist from that and protect him from what those words that could have come out of his mouth might have done to God's plans and purposes until Zechariah had got to a better place. I think it was the kindness of God and I think it was the discipline of God. But it didn't stop God fulfilling his purposes for Zechariah. He's looking for a people, friends. He's looking for us to be a people who know how to wait with expectation. I think it's hugely challenging. You know, I speak to myself, I find it hugely challenging. But actually, you know, there's a, and there's a work for us to do in waiting. But actually what this story demonstrates is, you know, God is never finished. God has always got more for us. God has always got more for us. And he's always got more for us than we dare ask or imagine. But waiting with expectation is part of that. 